morning, and I am Caitlin Burns. I am very excited to be talking to you all at ElixirConf today. Uh, I am from Launch Scout. We help companies to create software and to hire junior developers, usually in Elixir. And today my talk is motion commotion, motion tracking with Bumblebee and Live View. So what we're going to be going through today is we're going to be talking about, first of all, why Bumblebee and Live View for motion tracking, why they're good choices. Then we're going to be going over what my process was for trying to create this application. Then we are going to step-by-step -step create the application together, and then we're finally going to talk about some next steps for the application and what I would like to do to change this. There's going to be a lot of talk about references and a lot of tech talk, unsurprisingly. Um, if you find it overwhelming, don't worry. There's On the last slide, there is going to be a QR code to the GitHub repository for this project. And in the readme, it has sources to all the references I'm talking about. So without further ado, let's get moving. So let's see what it is we're going to be building today. So this is me on top of a trapeze. Um, if you're wondering why I'm up there, so was I. <laughs> but as you can see, we are tracking both the close curvature of myself up there as well as a rectangle. Um, there is also a component of prediction here. You can't see it with this particular video, but we'll be looking at it later. So. Yeah, this is what we are looking to do. So with that, let's talk about Bumblebee. Why did I pick Bumblebee for this project? First of all, it's approachable. I have always been interested in machine learning. Ever since I first started software engineering, there is a version of this product that I have always wanted to make. But machine learning was super overwhelming. It was clear the machine wasn't the only thing that would need to be learning. And machine learning wasn't actually my final goal. So it didn't seem like I was going to have the time to learn everything about machine learning. I wanted to build a cool Hot Wheels car. And the machine learning was the wheels. Didn't make sense to reinvent the wheels. So Thankfully, there are amazing people out there who know more about machine learning than I do who have already solved these problems. And Bumblebee allows me to take their amazing knowledge and quickly put it in my application so that I can work on the part that I am more focused on, which is the motion tracking. OK, why Live View? Well, the main crux of the reason is I like Elixir. Go figure here. Um, and it, a lot of the tutorials on how to do motion tracking were in Python. But as far as I could tell, there was really no reason for that. I didn't want to have to learn Python to make one application. I have done one function in Python, and I think that's all I want to do to touch it in my lifetime. So. Besides my stickler for refusing to code in anything but Elixir, there's also another reason why Live View is a great choice for motion tracking, and that is its statefulness. Our app is constantly changing. We are going frame by frame and passing back the frame to our code and asking it to manipulate it and sending it back to the HTML. It makes absolutely no sense to change the rest of the application when all we care about is manipulating that video. It's not super clear in the video that I showed you that that's a big deal because it's the only thing on the screen. But presumably, if you're going to be using this in your applications, it's not just going to be a blank screen with a video on it of me doing trapeze. Um, so we don't want to change the rest of our web page just because the video is changing constantly. So Live View, as far as I'm concerned, is the perfect choice for motion tracking. So let's talk about the research projects. As I was saying, when I first started searching, there were a lot of Python articles. 
When I searched for bumblebee in motion tracking, I got the motion patterns of a bumblebee, the insect, which is fascinating, but not the rabbit hole that I currently want to go down. Maybe later. Uh, when I put in Elixir and motion tracking, I found out that there's a very cool video game called Elixir that involves motion tracking. Again, fascinating, maybe after this talk, but not what I was interested in. And if I looked for Bumblebee motion tracking Elixir, I got a link to this talk, which was hilarious, but again, not helpful for me in this particular situation. So it became clear that I was going to have to improvise a little bit, get creative here. So I did find an article about how to classify an image frame by frame of a video and using Bumblebee. And this seemed like it was probably my first start. It wasn't the final goal, but it at least taught me how to manipulate videos. And it was also showing me how to use Bumblebee. So I was looking into this. The first thing I figured out that Bumblebee was going to be the least of my problems. Bumblebee is extremely easy to use, and we're going to be looking at that later. It's beautiful. Um, and so what it was clear that I was going to need to do was there was something called eVision that was being used in this article. And looking closer into it, it was a library in Elixir that is taking OpenCV, which is Python's image and video manipulation framework, and making it available in Elixir. So now suddenly, everything opened up. I now not only had access to every video manipulation article in Elixir, but I now had every article written in Python, but didn't have to write Python. So now I was looking into articles about eVision and motion tracking. Unfortunately, not a lot of those. But OpenCV and motion tracking, plenty. So that's where I was moving forward at this point. It became clear that my first objective was something called contouring. And I was assuming we weren't talking about makeup. But it is very similar contouring with makeup. You are highlighting your face. Contouring in motion tracking, you are finding the borders of an object and highlighting it, as it were. The problem with contouring is there are a lot of opinions about them. And there are a lot of options. You have to make a lot of assumptions with your application when you are contouring. You've got to know how complex is the object that we're tracking. Is it just a piece of paper? We only care about a square. Or is it a full human being? And we have a lot of angles to deal with. How accurate do we want the contouring to be? We have the option to look at every single line across the contour. Or if we really don't care about the shape all that much, we can approximate it. Also, do we care about only the contours that are on the outside of objects? the inside, or both, are we going to be ignoring contours, or do we want to see everything? Hint, you're going to want to ignore some unless you want your whole screen to look like a bunch of red squiggles. And how do we want the contours returned? The quickest way is to have it returned as a list. But if you're interested in the parent hierarchical, you can also return them as trees so that you can see what contours are inside of other contours. That was one function of this application that we had to ask questions about. There were, of course, other functions, unsurprisingly, to make this. And every single one of them, you had to ask the same kind of questions. How much should I blur this image to make it so that I can contour it later? What blurring calculation do I want to use? There's a few of them out there. And then we're going to do something called thresholding later. And you had to decide what value you wanted for your threshold. Or if you even wanted to use threshold. There were a lot of articles that said thresholding is great, and other ones that said, don't touch thresholding with a 10-foot pole. Use a thing called canny. Everyone has their opinions about these things. And I want to go forward with this by saying, 
I also had my opinions about this when making this application. So if you touch it later, I would highly recommend playing with the values and looking into what those values mean because it's arbitrary. There is no perfect solution for this, unfortunately. So let's get to building. First things first, we're going to th need three dependencies to build this app. Very simple. We're going to need, of course, Bumblebee, unsurprising. Uh, we're going to need something called EXLA. E -X -L -A. I'm adding extra letters there. Um, we're going to be talking about that in just a second, what the use of that is. And then we're going to be using eVision, that library that I was talking about earlier. So at the bottom of our config file here, we're going to be setting up NX to use EXLA as its backend. What is NX? I haven't been talking about that. That's OK. We don't need to worry about it. NX is the framework in which Bumblebee is built off of. And the reason that we're using EXLA as our backend is it compiles our data so that Bumblebee can send it to our module and translate it. Uh, a lot of people have been asking me, is this on the CPU? Is this on the GPU? How fast was it? And until a couple of days ago, I didn't know how to answer that question. And it turns out it's because EXLA does it for me. Um, it will look and see what is the fastest compiler that you have available, and we'll just use that. So again, wonderful things that I don't have to think about, which I am very happy about. So Bumblebee, what's the buzz? Bumblebee is going to allow us to use pre-trained machine learning models. What does that mean? As I was talking about earlier, somebody else has already done this beautiful work. All we need to do is put it in our application, pass it our data, it'll tell us what it sees. We need two things in order to do this. We need the model and the featureizer. The model is just the part that creates the prediction and the featureizer is what translates our data that we're going to hand to it to the model. So what models do we have available? Bumblebee currently has quite a few models available. They have audio, text, image, just to name a few. There are some more on there. If you're curious on what models are available, if you go to the hex docs, on Bumblebee, it has a whole list of the models. Unfortunately, we may be noticing here that none of these models are motion tracking models. That's OK. We, we're going to do some magic and pretend like there is one here. Uh, we're going to make it ourselves. For more information on any of these models, check out the hex docs or Hugging Face. Hugging Face is where these models are hosted, and we'll be getting them from for Bumblebee. So now that we've talked about the model, let's actually load it. We're going to create a serving function that takes our model. In this case, I used convnext. Again, this was totally opinionated. I tried with every single one of the image classification. Didn't see a difference. They all saw the same thing. Spoilers, not the right thing, but we'll get to that. Um, and then we have the featureizer for convnext. Then we're going to pass it to Bumblebee's image classification function. All this is going to do is tell our serving, our NX serving function, which we're going to make later, exactly how we want to compile this data. There's a lot of information here. It's not as complicated as it looks. Top K just means I only care about what it really thinks the image is. I don't care about its second or third guess. And compiling, I only want to see one batch at a time, and then we are telling it to send it to EXLA because we don't want to deal with it. Let EXLA do it. OK. So we did it. We have machine learning, kind of. It's in there, but it's not actually doing anything. If you turn on your server, it is technically there, but we are not predicting things. So what's the point? So we are going to pass our 
machine learning a frame because it is interested in an image and unfortunately we have a video. Easy enough. We're going to take our video and we're going to pass it to evision.videocapture.read. All that does is take the first frame of a video, return the video without that frame so that we can keep looping through those frames. And then we are going to pass that frame to a predicting function. And we're going to encode it. Basically, we're looking at matrices right now, and our computer doesn't know how to look at matrices, so we're turning it back into an image. That's all that encoding is. So to predict, we need to take our frame and turn it into an NX matrix. Again, Bumblebee is built off of NX. What's the difference between what we're passing it and a matrix? We're not going into the matrix right now. Sorry, red pill people, we are not looking into it. All you need to know is that we're taking our data and converting it into something that NX can read, and then we're going to do that NX backend transfer in order to send it to EXLA to make it so that the data is readable by our model. And then we're going to serve it with that NX serving function. It's going to pass our function that we made earlier, as well as that frame, and give us back a prediction. So let's see what we've got so far. I want to be clear, the video is currently playing. It's extremely slow. This is not a picture of me sitting in my room. Oh, there we go. See, I'm a hand dryer now. We're a mask. Here we go. Oh, now I'm a seatbelt. OK. I do not move this slow, I promise. I am slow in the morning, not this slow. OK, so we've got something going here. It's not perfect yet. We need to do some fixing here. But you know, it's cool. It, it's, it's a start. So we're going to make a little bit of assumption here to make our app a little faster. This assumption is going to be that whatever it is we want to predict is going to be in frame one. We're going to go back in time before object permanence was a thing. And we're going to assume that if we can't see it, it doesn't exist and we really don't care about it. So all we're going to do is predict the first frame so that we are making this application a little faster. So what we're doing here is we're saying if there is no prediction, send it to our prediction. If there is one, just keep going through the frames. Gotta love pattern matching. OK, now let's see what we got here. Look at those ducks go. It says they are stink horns. They are not. So we are going to try and make our predictor a little more accurate. It is faster but it seems to be a little bit overwhelmed by the data that we're passing it. So we're going to try and get rid of that pesky background because, again, we don't care about what's going on in the background. And hopefully, if it's only being passed a small image, it'll have a little bit more luck figuring out what we're looking at. So in order to do that, we need to get rid of some of the detail to get rid of some of the detail. It's, yeah. So first things first, we need to take our video and turn it to gray. So we've got this function here that's converting the color. We're going from BGR, aka blue, green, red, to gray. And then we're doing something called a Gaussian blur. What is a Gaussian blur? It is a function that blurs that does a lot of math in the background that I don't understand and thankfully don't have to because it does. All we are passing it, though, is the dimension of our blurring matrix, aka okay, how big do we want the blur to be? We're putting a mask over the top of it. And it's sigma x, which just means how far on the x-axis we want the blurring to be off. Complicated math, again, please download this. Try it yourself. It's a lot easier to understand if you're changing the numbers and seeing how the blurring changes. But let's see our beautifully gray and blurry video. Cool. So now that we have basically a really bad home video, we can do what our goal is here, which is thresholding. 
So we talked about that earlier. What is thresholding? Basically, we are passing it a number and saying, if anything is darker than this color, make it black. If anything is lighter than this color, make it white. And threshold binary there just means that we want the black to be black, the white to be white. You can do the inverse, but we're not doing that because we don't want to right now. So we have a binary image. Computers love binary. And there it is, our black and white video. Who would have thought that in order to go to the future, we have to go back in time to black and white videos, but here you go. So now we can finally find our contours because we have given it a lot less details. Let's be honest, videos, especially with the cameras that we have nowadays, have a lot of detail in it. And we really don't care about the pimple I had on my face that day or that hair that I had over here. We just want the full picture. So now that we have just the framing, we're going to do our find contours function. We are doing it as a retrieval list, as I talked about earlier, it's faster. And for this particular use, we really don't care whether a contour is inside of another contour. So we're just doing the fastest one. And chain approximation in this case is saying, do we want to see every single pixel along this line? And in this case, we're saying yes, because we're looking at people, ducks, things that have a lot of shapes, and I don't want it to return a triangle. Um, this video that I'm going to show right now is going to show you the contours. This function does not actually draw the contours. We're doing that later. I am just showing them to you so we can kind of understand what these things that I've been talking about look like. And these are contours. Again, there's still quite a few here. You're seeing the shadow on my face. You're seeing the lighting. We're but we only want to get rid of the background. We don't want to get rid of the shadows on my face or anything else. We want to pass in my full face for now. So what we're going to do is we are going to sort our contours by shape, and we're going to make another big assumption here that the background is bigger than the thing that we're tracking. Usually true. Again, maybe not for your situation. You really need to think about these things when you're building this app. So we're going to take that biggest contour, and we are going to use polyfill on it and fill it in with white. That's all we're doing is we're saying, take this shape, make it white, get rid of it, and make a prediction on it. So here we are. Here is our frame with no background in it. It's still got some stuff in it, but we're, you know, only can do so much without eliminating the entire image. And let's see how it does. Nope, I'm still a mask. Machine learning is still learning. Um, I'm sure people have seen this. It's, this is not new. We're going to call it good, but image prediction in particular is really complicated. I mean, I don't know if that's a blueberry muffin or a chihuahua. How do I expect my computer to know that? I have arguments all the time about what is a sandwich. How do I expect my computer to know what a sandwich is? So we're going to give it a break today. We're going to call it good. I am a mask now. That is just my ducks are mops. Trapeze is a mosque. It's fine. We're, we're going to give it a break. So let's get to the tracking part of this motion tracking. Thankfully, that work that we just did was not a waste. That contouring is actually the first step in our tracking situation. So we're just going to run that contouring function again. And There's so many things in this image. Look at those rungs of the ladder and the light switches and the cars and the too much, too much, too much, too much, too much. We're going to get rid of some of it. We're going to make another assumption here. Again, a lot of those. We are going to assume 
that the objects that we're tracking are about mid-size in our image. Anything that is too small is details we don't care about, a fly flew into the window. And anything too big is the background. So we're gonna give us a minimal area and a max area. For mine, it was 5,000 and 500,000. This was the best that I could find that could do both a video of me sitting extremely close to the screen and also a video of me way up in the air. So we're gonna take it and we're going to put it to a reject function. We're gonna calculate the area of each of our contours and if it is not in that range, get rid of it. We don't care. Let's look at that video again. There's still a lot, but it's a little more manageable. And unfortunately, we can't really just say, this is the contour I want without clicking on the video and saying, this is the one I want. And presumably, you don't want to do that. So. We're gonna have a little extra in there so that we don't get rid of the thing that we're actually tracking. Now we're going to actually draw those red lines that we've been seeing this whole time. It's pretty easy. All we have to do is tell it what color we want it to be. I picked red. Again, arbitrary. The index, we're giving it negative one, which just means draw all of them. There's not one in particular we're interested in. We wanna see them all and then we're going to draw the contour, and we're also gonna draw those blue rectangles that we've been seeing earlier. These are called bounding rectangles. A bounding rectangle is just a rectangle that can be the smallest that it can be, but still fit the whole shape in it. So we're going to pass it to our bounding rectangle function and then we're gonna just tell it to draw a rectangle with that calculation, and in this case, make it blue so that we can tell the difference between our red lines and our blue lines. And here it is. It is our final project. Excuse me, they're not mops, they're swabs. I'm sorry, I, I misread the misreading. Um, is it perfect? No. Is it cool? Yes. This took about 140 lines of code max, and that included the actual live view itself, setting up the view, which is mind-blowing to me personally. I expected this project to be pages upon pages of code, and it wasn't. It was just a few functions to get this far. But again, it's not perfect. What would I like to do next to improve this? My next steps would be, first of all, there are things off screen. As much as I would like to pretend that everything we're going to track, we know exactly what it is before we even start, that's not true. So one way to do this without slowing the application too much is I would like to see how many objects are currently on screen, and if that number is the same, don't retrack it. If there are more objects, redo the prediction. That being said, we're also only tracking one object currently, which generally there's probably more than one thing. We even saw in my video there were three ducks. We would like to have them all labeled. But the tricky part about tracking individual objects is you can pass the first screen and put a label on it. But again, we don't want to predict every single frame and remake those labels for every single frame. So how do we know where that object has moved in the next frame to move our label with it? More assumptions, but these ones are probably more likely to be true. If they're not, please talk to me later. I'm very curious about what you're tracking. We are going to assume that the things that we are tracking are not growing or shrinking rapidly between screens, and we are going to assume that they are not teleporting. Again, if they are, please talk to me. I am fascinated. Uh, so to keep track of the labels, I would just keep track of the closest object to where the label was before and that is around the same size, put the label on that. Didn't get there with this application, but that is what the next steps 
would be. The real next step, though, is everyone that is watching this right now. Because as much fun as I have had with this, there are a lot of people with a lot of ideas in here, presumably. Um, there are a lot of people. I'm going to assume you have a lot of ideas. And there were a lot of assumptions in this application, as I said, and I needed to make those assumptions to make it work. If I didn't say what size I thought the item was in this application, we either wouldn't have contours or we'd be looking at a bunch of red snakes. And neither one of those is really helpful. Also, the complexity of the objects. If you're searching for a piece of paper, you really don't want to see every single line. All you care is about is a square, so you can simplify it a bit. Also, manipulating the values. Is the blurring that I did correct, or can you find a value that's better? Again, every article that you're going to read is going to have an opinion on this. No one has a consistent answer, so maybe your answer is different than mine. Also, hands-on learning. I used to be a teacher. I was a major in psychology, big fan of hands-on learning. Everybody should do it. The main point of this talk was not that I can build a motion tracking app, but any of you can as well. It was far more simple than I thought it was going to be, especially in the beginning where I couldn't find any research where someone had yet. When I saw that there weren't any articles on it, I went, oh, there's a reason they asked me to keynote for this. This is bad. But there are articles out there for it. It's just not in Elixir. And I think that's ridiculous. It should be in Elixir. Elixir is great. We are making huge strides in AI as well as video manipulation. And because of eVision, we can now take advantage of all those Python people's research, as well as, hopefully, please take advantage of my research. Uh, if you do do that, my contact information is up here. If you have any questions or if you make something, please let me know. I am fascinated with all of this. There is also a QR code to the repo, as well as my company is currently doing a survey on Elixir adoption. We're curious about how that is going. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, we'd really appreciate it. Thanks again. I am Caitlin. Thanks so much for listening to my talk. And happy coding, everyone.